Sure, two. I didn't change my dog. I should. Uh, all various examples were great. Um, okay, uh, I'm I'm in a postdoc. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Konstanz in Germany, and in our group we are very interested in understanding what are the molecular mechanisms underlying uh, phenotypic variation about species. Uh, and if you're wondering, these are not secrets. They are um, a human and a chimp. And the reason why I put this here is to is because 40 years ago, uh, Kim, uh, Kim and Wilson speculated that most of the difference among species were due to regulatory processes rather than structural changes because the proteins between these two species were really similar. And that has been an on and off discussion for a long time on uh, uh, what is the relative roles of these two mechanisms. And actually, maybe it's more, more um, fruitful to, to ask in which situation you expect one rather than the other one. And, and I would try to argue that cyclists are great. Uh, the visual system of cyclists are a great uh, um, system to study this for multiple reasons. First, uh, as everybody explained before, and uh, it's, it's easy to me now um, to, to present this, is um, that um, we know a lot about opsins, and opsins are the few proteins for which we can uh, somehow predict the phenotype consequences of amino acid substitutions. Um, just a reminder, the opsins are the protein components of, of photopigments. Uh, the other component, it's a chromophore uh, derived from A1 or A2 vitamins. Uh, for example, this is, uh, we can characterize these photopigments by the peak of maximum absorption, where they absorb mo most of the light, and this is a, a green pigment in humans. And um, it differs from the red pigment just by three amino acid substitutions in key places that affect the tuning. And, uh, and this has repeated in a lot of species, and, and these changes are, are crucial. So we understand that certain sites, uh, when there is an, an amino acid substitute, results in a change in the peak of, of sensitivity. Um, other ways, it, it, the peak of sensitivity can change in different ways. For example, you can change the A1, A2 uh, vitamins, and you result in, in a shift of all your, your visual pigments. For example, here's a shift, uh, a red shift, to, uh, or a shift to the longer wavelength when you, you go from uh, A1 vitamin chromophore in the solid line and dash line will be an A2. Another reason why options are great is because there has been duplication. So we, we just saw this in a, in, in, in a sheet duplications and divergence, and we just see this in other examples. So we can use them to um, see different colors. For example, as humans, uh, here we have three of them, and we can see um, uh, we have a three chromatic vision. Uh, other mammals and some monkeys, uh, especially neotropical monkeys, have a dichromatic vision, and um, some animals have only monochromatic. So you, you see how important it is to have diversity. So we have three, and we see three chromatic. Imagine being a sequence where you have seven. Um, the, the catch here is that they don't express all the seven at the same time. Uh, they actually still have a three chromatic vision. Tetrachromatic sunkites. This is discussable, but no time today. Um, but uh, the way they do it is actually just to make our life easier. They organize the retinas in single cones and double cones. In the single cones, they will express one of the three uh, short wave sensitive pigments, the UV, the violet, or the blue, just only one of those. And then in the double cones, they will express either two of the three green options they have or one green one green and one red. And secrets are great because they have been shown that this these two mechanisms affect the vision of the secrets and uh, different conditions do affect. So today I will argue that a great system to look at this are the Maya secrets from Nicaragua. So Nicaragua is here. Right now we are somewhere here. Here is Argentina, we will win the cup. You, you should see that. <laughs> Copa America. Yeah, Brazil is, is gone already, so. <laughs> Cheer for Argentina. Okay, so we are in Nicaragua right now. Uh, Nicaragua has these two great fresh water lakes. For now, I don't know, when the canal comes, maybe not anymore. And, and they are the source of, a, a, of, of these mild seaweeds that have colonized multiple crater lakes along uh, the border of these great lakes. 
And the two great population, uh, two great lakes are connected by this river, and there is a lot of stream flow, and, and there is very little differentiation between those. So I would prefer as those as Taperon is clicking. As the Great Lakes, and these Great Lakes are not very old, they are more or less half a, a million year old, and, but the Cradle Lakes are really, really young. Actually, the oldest one is, for example, Lake Apoyo here. It's 20,000 uh, years, and it, it, there has been a radiation in that lake resulting in six different species. The, the, the second diverse lake is Cradle Lake here, Hiroa here, which is um, 6,000 years old. These dates are the last time we know there was an eruption in that crater lake. So the colonization of those crater lakes might happen way later. So uh, current estimation tells us that the, the, the minor sibling in this lake is more or less 2,000 generations old, and in this lake it's 1,000 to 2,000 generations old. Today I will just compare uh, the visual system from these great lakes, which are we call the source population, with the crater lakes. And the reason why I expect changes is because the visual environments of the Crater Lakes and the Great Lakes are completely different. Mm -hmm. The first obvious thing is that Crater Lakes are, have very clear water and the ancestral lakes are very turbid. So if you just take a measurement of the Zekedis in a crater, in a Great Lake, you will just see half a meter, while in a Crater Lake you can see up to seven meters in Lake Apollo and, uh, and almost five meters in, in Lake Hiloa. But of course we can measure, measure gradients. And if we do this, for example, in the Great Lake here in the dash line, and in Apoyo here in the Great Lake, at the surface you see that the gradient is, is the same, and this is obvious, there's no filters, it's just measuring the light. But if we do, go two meters deep, then we see a great difference. So first we know that the water will filter a lot of the reds here, and it disappears in both lakes, in the Great Lakes and the Crater Lakes. But then in Lake Apoyo, there is no filter of the blue light. It's almost exactly as it was in the surface, as you can see if I do this. <laughs> um, uh, but it, it is filtered in the Great Lakes. So what is going on here is that we have a red shifted environment in the Great Lakes and a blue shifted environment in the Crater Lake. So if I will predict that there will be a change, it will look something like this. I don't know how to click, sorry. Okay. So if we will predict that it's uh, a change, it will be something like this. So this is the, the, the Great Lake, and this is the phenotype we predict. Uh, this is the predicted double cones. Uh, remember I told you that they are organized in single cones and double cones. Single cones are for the, for the short sensitive uh, pigments, and this is for the red and the green sensitive pigments. So we will expect that they will be um, shifted to the long wavelength in both the double cones and the single cones, but then when they colonize the the crater lakes, they will shift to shorter wavelength in both cones. So these, these are my predictions. And uh, of course, the first thing I, I have to do is go and measure phenotypes to see if they are different. So I, I did this. I, I didn't have the fancy electrode to, to measure. So, so I just cut it open the, it, the eye and measure it with uh, 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 spectrophotometry, um, which measures the peak of maximum absorption. And this is more or less what you see when you do it in a uh, fish from the Great Lakes, actually this is five, the red peak is uh, five uh, nine four, which is quite red shifted. And when you do the same in the Crater Lake, for example, when you uh, Lake Apoyo, you see a, a strong shift towards the blue in all the pigments. Um, not that much in the green blue. Um, and this more or less is the same in Lake Hiloa, but it's less, uh, not as impressive as in Lake Apoyo, but still you can see a shift, especially in the reds, and a little bit in the green. Okay, so I wanted to know where, where are the mechanisms of, of this difference. So the first thing is I asked if there are structural changes in oxygen genes among uh, minor cichlids, and, uh, and the thing I did is sequence the options, the full options, uh, for, for the minor cichlids, and they have seven different options uh, from SWS1 to low wave sensitivities as African cichlids do. And um, this, each of these proteins is more or less 350 amino acids, so I only found eight variable sites across the seven things. So less, more or less one amino acid in each protein, which is not that much. And more importantly, only one of those amino acids variable sites is known to produce any effect in the tuning of, of the vision. 
and it's the in the red pigment here, position 164, which is also it's 180 in humans that I showed at the beginning. And uh, we know that it can produce a shift, but it's a very small shift uh, in humans. And what we see is that the ancestral population here, um, um, the frequency of the two alleles, the one with the A and the one with the S, are more or less 50-50, but then the red shifted allele disappear in the cradle legs. And it's hard to put uh, uh, an adaptive value to this because this can also happen just by um, uh, the bottleneck, but it's interesting that it happens in the same direction in both legs when the frequency is almost the same in the ancestral legs. Okay, my second question. So, to summarize this, there are very few amino acid substitution, very few structural changes in the proteins. So my second question was how many, if there are changes in the um, opsin expression sequence. And um, actually, I, I should take advantage of this colorful slide to congratulate the fellows Americans for their great achievement in human rights. Congratulations to all of them. Okay, um, so this is the expression in, in red legs, and this is proportion, proportional expression, so this uh, represent of the whole pool of opsin expressed in the eye, how much is each of the different opsins I found them. And I suspect that they express a lot of the red uh, pigment, uh, the, the one of the greens, and then the most uh, red shift, uh, long way shifted blue one, SWS2. And this will be single tones in this double. When I repeat this for the cracker legs, what I see is a different pattern, which is significantly different, but still they express more or less the, the same tones. But for example, in leg apoyo here, we can see a, a big, uh, they are starting to express SWS to B. They express both, both of them. But um, this peak, this um, gene, uh, matches very well the peak of the blue allele, that, the, the blue phenotype that we saw in Lake Apoyo. So even though they are expressing both, we only found this when we measured the phenotype. Um, so we don't understand what they are doing with this. But also we see a change here where um, the amount or the proportion of, of expression of the red uh, allele, uh, sorry, allele, no, uh, opsin, decreased significantly in both legs uh, and the green increases. So if we use this to compare to our prediction that was a, a shift, we can predict also with the, the expression what will be the shift in the, in the um, uh, sensitivity. And sorry for using the same colors of red, green, and blue. Mm -hmm. Doesn't make sense, but I did. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so in gray legs, you see the red here, and, and you can see that the different individuals we measure predicting from the gene expression are, are long way shifted. And then from kilo A, which was intermediate, they look here intermediate, but then Apoyo are uh, quite shifted towards uh, short wave sensitivities. Um, and this matched pretty well what we see when we, we actually measure the phenotype using MSPs. So I hope I convince you that um, there are changes in the, in the phenotype of myelin cichlids when they colonize the cradle legs, and this shift appears to be adapted because it's, the whole vision is shifted to the short wavelength, um, short wavelength sensitivity, which uh, makes sense given the environment where they are. And my results suggest that most of these changes are due to changes in gene expressions rather than structural changes in the protein itself. Um, so this will more or less um, um, agree with the ideas of, of, of uh, Ian and Wilson, but just in the vision. Um, and, and this might be because, as I show you, there, are, there were very few variable sites, even in the source population. So that means that there was very little standard genetic variation. And these are very few generations old, these are populations are very uh, few generations old, so you need for mutations that actually do something in addition to uh, arise just by chance and then get kicked. So that's probably the reason why uh, they might um, use different mechanisms that just as structural changes in protein. But of course there are other changes. We saw, I, I tried to mention the LWS, that might make sense. But also another way to explain 
most of the changes that I see, or, or a good proportion of the changes I see, is that they might be um, changing uh, from using an A1 uh, chromochore to an A2 chromochore. And this is an interesting thing because I, you can see three different ways in which they are actually changing the vision system. So they are using a combination of, of, of uh, molecular mechanisms rather than just sticking to um, okay, so with that, I think uh, people in the lab that helped me uh, produce this data, my sources funding, and my daughter, Jorgelina, who allows me to sleep at night, which is great. <laughs> I will take questions if there are time. <laughs>